Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, if you were at ODI or tuned in uh, ten, day, ten days ago, you will have uh, heard some of this, so I apologize. But I can see there are some uh, some new friends uh, tuned in. The first question, then, what crisis do we have? And there is, uh, you can see from this, that there is increasing evidence that large numbers of rural hand pumps drawing from groundwater are not functional within quite a short time of them being uh, constructed and installed. So many benefits are lost. Uh, and this crisis is hidden, or is often hidden, because much of the focus is on coverage statistics rather than true access. It's estimated that perhaps 300 million people are still without uh, improved water supplies in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is an important concern, and this is a, one of the reasons why we think the results of this study will be so important. But, uh, many of these people are in highly groundwater-dependent countries. And we know from past experience that uh, those of us working in this area will have to work pretty hard to find adequate groundwater where some of these groundwater conditions are fairly difficult. And so you can immediately see that there is a broad policy implication coming from the work that we've, we've been doing. Why do hand pump supplies fail? Uh, there's a lot of anecdotal information, much of which been, has been discussed in previous uh, webinars uh, facilita facilitated by Kirsten and uh, uh, Mechanical breakdowns, poor quantity of water, quality, lack of community involvement, all kinds of reasons. But why do they really fail? And the UPRO program, uh, with its uh, emphasis on evidence collection, offered us a unique opportunity to, to look. Uh, and you can see there on the slide our, the hypothesis for our work. And if we can really, really understand, well, uh, the important words are there on the slide. If we can uh, understand why hand pumps really fail, uh, and the reasons are complex and based in a number of disciplines, if we can really understand them, then we can probably do something about it. And we set up, uh, before we started the field work, an analytical scheme. Yeah, be before we started the field work, we looked at the symptoms, causal factors, and underlying conditions uh, in a sort of analytical scheme, and it's a little bit akin to looking at it from a medical point of view, the, the symptoms of the patient, the immediate causal factors, and the underlying conditions and root causes of failure. And because it is a multidisciplinary task, uh, we needed some good people uh, in the team. It's actually not as simple as the previous diagram. Um, this is uh, also an analytical scheme of the linkages that we put together before we started the field work. With the failure of the water supply service in the center of the scheme, the, uh, the immediate symptoms in orange around it, the black text is the uh, other causal factors, and the red on the outside of the underlying conditions. And you won't have time to look at all that now, but these slides will be available uh, afterwards. So it's a question of starting in the center with a failure, asking why, why this, why that, why this happens, why the other happens, and moving outwards to the, the underlying causes. Because if it's the underlying causes that we need to address, if we're going to improve things. So a simple approach to the study. We worked with uh, our colleagues, WaterAid and the colleagues in Uganda, 
on, on the basement aquifer in Amuria and Katakwe districts in eastern Uganda. We undertook a community survey first, uh, at 24 water points, and then we did some focused technical field investigations later. And I'll just show you a few of the results. The community surveys identified from uh, talking to the communities, we managed to find out quite a lot about the, the storyline, the story behind the failure from a community point of view, and <clears throat> to look at what was the, their, the community's viewpoint as to what were the uh, dominant symptoms of failure, poor yield, poor water quality, yield and water quality, uh, seasonal factors or mechanical breakdown of the hand pump. We then in, chose a subset of 10 of these and we really took the pumps <coughs> and the boreholes apart. And this is an there was an opportunity to do something that uh, I and some of the other members of the project team had been wanting to do for a very long time. So we, we observed the pump operation and condition at the ground surface. We took out, observed, measured and photographed the failed pumps. And you can see there immediately on the right hand side the, the corrosion and the iron, iron staining. We measured the borehole depths. Uh, took the water levels and the vert verticality of the boreholes. We inspected the boreholes with closed circuit television, which we hadn't done before, and we were able to get a lot of information about the conditions of the casing and the inside of the boreholes. We carried out limited pumping tests where there was a sufficient yield to be able to do that. And we took full field and laboratory chemistry to, to look at the the cause, the underlying causes, and the, uh, of the water quality problems. And for us, this was a this was an important novel aspect of the study. So we developed uh, a matrix for these ten sites, starting on the left-hand side with the, the pattern of failure, whether the failure was repeated, uh, catastrophic catastrophic failure soon after in installation, or whether there were seasonal problems. We identified the main symptom of failure, and then moving across the right-hand side of the matrix, uh, the causal factors, the lack of groundwater resource, poor siting, poor construction, poor materials, uh, and difficulties that the community had with managing and taking care of the pumps. Uh, and the orange, uh, you can see there, the orange are related to poor quality. Dominant causal factor, if the dominant causal factor was poor quality, it's shown in orange. If the dominant causal factor was low yield, shown in purple. Uh, and the blue ones are where the pump head had failed. And the gray are other contributory factors. So you can see that there was no, uh, there was no single factor that uh, caused the borehole to fail or the pump to fail in each case. It was, a, it was a combination of factors. And if we carry on asking why, and I've got the symptoms down the left-hand side, poor water quality, poor yield, and water quality, insufficient yield. And if we look, move across to the right, we can see what the dominant causal factors were. In the weathered basement aquifer in this part of Uganda and many of the neighboring countries, we have uh, low, uh, slightly acidic groundwater, low natural pH and EH, and the use of galvanized materials, which are a poor combination. The borehole design, in many cases, was not really appropriate for the aquifer, which is uh, where there is uh, the possibility of getting groundwater from the weathered uh, regolith and from the fractured bedrock. And in many cases, it wasn't really clear whether the uh, implementing agencies were targeting one or the other, and some were a compromise. Uh, poor siting, 
sometimes it wasn't very clear how the siting, how the sites were chosen, and the uh, groundwater conditions in some of these aquifers are pretty difficult in the first place. We also looked at the different parts of the service delivery chain in terms of implementation, pre-construction, construction and maintenance. And this is a sort of simple traffic light matrix. And you can see that uh, in this particular pilot study, and this wouldn't necessarily be the case elsewhere, many of the worst problems relate from the time of uh, the construction part of the process. The design of the borehole, the materials that were used, uh, the lack of supervision in the field, and so on. You can see that. Uh, and again, you'll be able to look at these slides uh, in more detail afterwards. So if we start <coughs> again asking why and working backwards from the causal factors to the underlying conditions and the root causes, through the process that I just uh, described to you. In our uh, pilot project area, we could, fit, we could easily identify four underlying conditions that are policy and program related. Uh, entrenched practices in the implementing agencies, poor decision making, fixed on certain designs despite the prevailing conditions, a lack of understanding of the local groundwater conditions affecting the design of the boreholes and the pumps, uh, the discovery that uh, <coughs> corrosion was a problem was not a new discovery at all, um, and these types of materials have been used for a long period of time, deficiencies in the procurement processes and contracting arrangements, uh, in this project and in other areas that I've worked in, the, the methods of uh, setting up contracts and procuring the uh, siting and construction of boreholes themselves almost mitigate against uh, the possibility of, of adequate supervision. And lo and behold, we, we could see that from uh, what the results that we saw in the field and from talking to the communities. And all of these derive partly from an absence of technical capacity in, uh, in, uh, in implementing agencies, in the government, and, uh, and elsewhere. For the communities, uh, lack of training, difficulty in uh, collecting and managing finance, and poor communication channels from the village communities to, uh, to other levels and other in le possibilities for institutional support were lacking when, uh, when there were serious problems and they, they, things, problems didn't get well communicated. And these would have been important or even dominant, but at the sites in, the, in our pilot study, the program related root causes and the, the results in terms of poor construction uh, haven't really given the communities much of a chance. They've been, uh, they've almost been sold a dud, really, before they get started. What next? Well, in a small pilot project, you can't possibly uh, achieve everything that you want to achieve. We need to examine the result roles and the responsibilities and capacity of the different levels of government. Uh, responsibility and capacity doesn't always lie at the same level. We need to look at the relationship between community arrangements and wider governance and institutional arrangements and how these can communicate with each other. We need to look a little bit harder at the various roles of the private sector in terms of borehole construction, procurement, contracting, maintenance, provision of spare parts. The private sector has a key role to play. And we need to look at more sites. Our field sample was very small and, and fairly biased and uh, in one particular hydrogeological environment. We need to look at seasonal and time factors. Both our technical and community surveys were, were snapshots. 
and we need to con continue to think conceptually about the science of, and the logic of cause and effect. You know, it isn't always that uh, when one thing happens and you observe another, it doesn't automatically follow that one thing is causing the other. Cause and effect are difficult things to study. And we have an opportunity to do these and to extend to Malawi and to Ethiopia in the full uh, UpGrow Consortium grant, which we've been fortunate enough to, uh, to win. So, final message. When you go into the site, look in the field, every picture tells a story uh, in terms of water quality, water quantity, the symptoms, and some of them lead back quite a long way through the causal factors to the underlying program conditions. And it's often some of these that we really need to tackle. Thank you, and I apologize for the interruptions. Thank you.